Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to give it a moment and wait for some people to file in. Thanks for joining us today. All right. Well, good afternoon and thanks so much for joining us today. Welcome to the 25th edition in our webinar series on the convergence of wetland science and tech. My name is Cameron Davis and I'm the marketing associate here at Ecobot. Uh, today's topic is tools and tech for wetland mitigation banking. We've got some fantastic panelists with us today who will be introduced in just a few minutes. Um, once we kick things off, we're eager to have a two-way dialogue during the presentations. Uh, down at the bottom of your Zoom window, you should see a Q&A button. Please use that to ask any questions that you might have, um, and our uh, panelists will take a look at those at the end of the discussion and provide some answers. Um, our host today is my colleague with nearly two decades experience as a wetland scientist and also the co-founder and chief scientist here at Ecobot, Jeremy Shavey. So I'll hand it off to Jeremy to get started. Great, thank you, Cameron, and welcome back everyone and who have who's joined us here in the past for this wonderful series of webinars that we've been putting on since the uh, pandemic a few years ago. Um, and for those of you who are joining us here for the first time, uh, welcome. I hope you will enjoy what we have gathered and what we're going to present today. Um, I would launch off with saying first and foremost that we've been saying nearly two decades of wetland experience for the last three years since we've been doing these mitigation uh, or these wetland science uh, webinars. And I, th I think I'm gonna have to check my math, but we might be at two decades now. It's getting a little scary, but uh, time passes. Um, so, um, I'll have to just set up a better monitor for that so I can track my time a little bit better. So uh, I am just coming back from field work over in Ireland, Scotland, and uh, the Azores in the middle of the Atlantic. And there's some fantastic high elevation blanket and caldera bogs um, on the Azores that are just absolutely phenomenal. Some of them have now been put into uh, UNESCO World as UNESCO World Heritage Sites. And so I'm coming off of being very alive from being out in the field in very remote areas away from human beings. And so I wanted to set that up as a way of saying, as, a, as an invitation to remember why we're doing all of this. Yes, of course, mitigation banking is an excellent way that we can economically support the longevity of the ecosystems that are important to our planet, but also the whys behind it, why we fell in love with these places of nature and why they're important for the future. So again, I wanna thank all of the panelists and presenters who are have joined me here today as we get ready to jump into our 25th webinar. Um, we've got a great spread of consultants and uh, 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 software providers, but in the sense like everyone here has boots on the ground experience as well as planning, architectural engineering experience um, and our movers and shakers in their seats in this industry. So today we have joining us Tara Alden from Kibley Horn, and Tara has been working in the mitigation banking industry since 2002. Um, I'm not even sure if I knew what that was yet then. I was at that point still figuring out all my field work. And so I'm very excited to have Tara's experience join us here on the panel today. Um, and she's been working in the confluence of wetland science and law for most of her career. Daniel Martin is also a returning veteran from years past. Uh, a consultant project manager from Esri, background in landscape architecture and planning, has been involved in multiple uh, environmental restoration projects, as well as some future planning-centric uh, uh, projects that 
are looking at the longevity of where things are going and how we can better manage our resources on the regional as well as the macro scale. Exciting projects Daniel's been working on. If he wants to speak into a little bit of that today, happy to have him share. And Robert Stewart with Water and Land Solutions. Uh, really enjoy the team that I have always met and worked with, with Water and Land Solutions. Robert's not that far from me being based out of Johnson City, Tennessee, and I'm here in Asheville as a senior project engineer. And he's been involved with the consulting, the planning, the engineering, the installations, um, management of multiple mitigation bank uh, projects. So again, Tara, Daniel, Robert, thank you for joining us today. Looking forward to um, what you have to bring to the table. Just as a recalibration, sort of the heart, the essence of what has promulgated this webinar series forward is this interweave, this ecosystem that is in support of wetland stream and other natural resource sciences. The combination of GIS software that allows us to see, plan, uh, build, uh, look at potential impacts, and then the overflow of GPS receivers or GNSS receivers, which allows us to record highly accurate data with boots on the ground. And of course, field applications, the tools that allow us to do the mapping and the data collection and the processing out in the field. And then of course, drones and satellites that are also in support of allowing us to gather this information. And again, I think it's important to leave the, the, the coin to leave us with here is that while these are all tools there in, uh, that are helping promulgate our industry forward and helping us work more efficiently, they are also what are enabling our industry to be more proactive in the 21st century, to be able to bring data to potentially not only affect how we plan, but potentially to affect policy, to shape the way the world sees and understands our relationship with the earth and natural systems. So we bring that data forward and it helps to shape where things are going. Um, so just a brief synopsis of what we're going to be taking a look at today. Um, we're going to be first hearing from Daniel, who's gonna be talking about Esri's green infrastructure application. So we're gonna get some, I believe some screenshots and a little bit of a, a demo or showing within that. And that will be of course led by Daniel. I'm gonna share a little bit about Ecobot's current toolbox in respect to how data can be managed from existing projects to help with better planning for mitigation banking, or for at the very least to be able to harness the necessary information or data that you need to get your own projects either permitted more quickly or to pick up some of those extra uh, or, or to source out your mitigation banking needs. Um, and then Robert's gonna get in and share a little story with us in terms of some unique tools that are, uh, his, his company is utilizing in order to help A, uh, promote the intent of how a design is going to come together and to then a better be able to sell that to a client who's going to be potentially be a host for a mitigation bank um, and also what some of the details are that look like going into that. So all that said, we will have time at the end also for a general Q&A. So this is a great time to bring that up as we have another 40 or 50 people that have come in. All participants as well as speakers, if you take your cursor and bring it down to the bottom of the screen, you'll see a little bar come up. Um, and in that bar, you'll see two boxes that are really important. One says chat. In that chat box, if you just have general questions that are somewhat related or you just wanna say, Daniel, you're awesome. Thanks for presenting this portion. Like that's a great place to do that sort of thing. The other box that you can click on is the Q and A box. If you have technical questions, questions that are specific to the subject material that we are presenting today or a tangent therein, please direct that to this section. We do have Cameron and Liv 
in the background curating both sets of these questions. Whenever I'm not speaking, I will also be looking at that Q&A box to see if there are questions that make sense to bring forward to our Q&A uh, discussion at the end of our time here together today. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Daniel Martin, who, uh, gosh, we've been, we've been playing and working together for almost three years now. So Daniel, it's an honor to have you back on our webinar here. Um, and I'm looking forward to what you have to present. So over to you. Awesome, thank you, Jeremy. Um, and it's great to be back. But before we dive in, I, I have an important question. Can you all hear me? Yeah, okay, great. Um, as luck would have it, uh, my, my headset is on the fritz right now. So I'm uh, reduced to the laptop uh, microphone, which we all know is, is, is suboptimal. All right, if we're good to go, then I'm gonna hop over and steal the screen. Is it coming through? Okay, great. All right, everybody. So as Jeremy said, Daniel Martin, um, I work with Esri, which uh, many folks know as a software company, but there's actually a professional services division. And uh, so my days are spent kind of in project work, geospatial strategy and, and ways and tools to implement and support different areas of industry. Um, one of those areas, uh, because I kind of work within the natural resources, geodesign, um, and, and related uh, types of topics, is green infrastructure. And that's what I want to talk to everyone about uh, today. And uh, at a top level, why green infrastructure? So there's kind of two reasons that I think this would be of interest to you folks. Uh, the data and, and the tools that come along with the green infrastructure initiative. Uh, so as far as the data, uh, and I'll get into more details later, but there are derived data sets that we call the green infrastructure cores, which are minimally disturbed habitat and natural areas throughout the entire United States um, that are at least 100 acres in size and 200 meters wide. And those cores have a lot of really interesting and important environmental data that's kind of enriched into them. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, the second is the tools. And so the Green Infrastructure Initiative brings forward uh, a whole lot of really powerful geoprocessing and modeling tools um, that workflows that quite frankly used to take uh, hours and days to perform uh, can now be done in just a few moments. So uh, let me introduce you a little bit more to this initiative and we'll go from there. So Esri's Green Infrastructure Initiative, uh, the, the kind of official bumper uh, spe speech is that it's a collection of freely available and authoritative geospatial resources. Um, and the part I like to underline is the freely available. Right? These, this is really uh, a, lot of, a lot of really interesting stuff um, and it's free and not everything is, is free all the time. So, these resources were really helped and created by Esri to, to initiate uh, this, a national vision for green infrastructure planning, equipping local organizations and uh, scientific practitioners with tools to support these types of workflows, conservation, 30 by 30 decision-making, all of those sorts of things that I, I, I think we all uh, care deeply about. That's why these were made. And, uh, and why we, you know, uh, Esri made the decision to open them up uh, for everyone just to kind of get really high quality data out. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more. There's kind of a lot here. So I, I find it helpful to illustrate this in kind of four principal components. So the Esri derived data, this is what I was mentioning um, about the, the cores, uh, but there's also other derived data as well. Um, complementary data sets, things like landscape connectivity, habitat quality, um, and these are all really thought of as being the foundational building blocks of any sort of environmental workflow, whether that's 
conservation 30 by 30 or even wetland uh, banking. So I'll, uh, we'll, we'll actually look at some of these, these uh, data sets in a few moments. Next, we have uh, some of the relevant source data. Um, and this is the environmental data sets that um, often be, are brought into the workflow. So you can think of this as like federal data, um, state data, uh, and rather than having to download it and put it into a hard drive and carry it around, these are all living Atlas data sets. So they're all authoritative services you can bring into your maps at any time. But rather than having to go off and hunt for those, uh, they are actually made available kind of as part of the initiative. So everything is in, in one place. Next, we have these models. So the models are were used to generate the that new source data, the cores, the habitat and activity, things like that. And they're made available so that folks can further customize those models to new versions of the data that is really specific to what they're doing. Um, and they can calibrate it as needed. Um, we are also seeing uh, some interest in these from folks outside of the US. And so these really can be used as the starting point for them to create similar content in their regions. And finally, uh, we're in the era of WebGIS, so desktop workflows is not the, the, the sole um, place where GIS is done. Really, a lot is done in maps and apps that are online. So there's a, a suite of applications that are, uh, that, are, that are hosted as part of the initiative that have a, a lot of different kind of workflows. Uh, you kind of choose the app uh, that is of most interest to the workflow you want to dive into. And we'll look at those a little bit more. So I'm actually going to uh, go out on a limb and do a live demo here. I want to show you folks the, uh, the web resources, show you the easiest way to get to some of the data, and then we'll take a look at, uh, at some of the apps. So let me switch screens here. Should still be coming through. Um, all right, so what you see here is the main landing page for the Green Infrastructure Initiative. And this provides a whole lot of information. I'm not gonna go through all of it here, um, but it uh, is, is kind of the landing page get to all the different resources. And um, what, what you'll find is the process for green infrastructure planning that process really is, is tightly coupled with what I would call a geodesign centric approach, which is uh, which can be applied in, in more than just planning. So you could actually use this sort of methodology towards any sort of environmental projects, mitigation banking, environmental banking, and so on. So there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of value in, in that workflow there. There's also ways to contribute to uh, the green infrastructure initiative and the resources. So I'm going to click on resources here. And first off, um, if you're familiar with the living atlas of the world, um, you'll, you'll know that there's a lot of data sets made available there. These, this kind of data catalog is essentially bringing in services from the living atlas of the world, but instead of needing to go there and search around, it's, it's all in the same place. So there's ecological, cultural, scenic assets, hazard zones, conservation data sets, as well as boundaries. So you simply click on these and all of the data sets are, are portrayed there. You see here we have aquifers, land cover, surface water, prime vegetation, intact habitat cores, and you can continue to scroll through. These can be brought into your own maps or accessed. You just simply click the button and it'll open in a new tab and you can go from there. The Green Infrastructure Booklet is a downloadable PDF that has a lot of information in deeper detail than what I'm going to be talking about, but it, it does build out what is green infrastructure planning, what are these tools, how, is the, uh, how are these cores and the models derived, and, uh, and some of that other background information you might be interested in. There's also uh, several story maps that cover case studies of this data and the 
the models and tools in use and kind of the results of that. And a nice long uh, FAQ section for, uh, for some of the questions that we hear uh, most often. Now I'm gonna hop over to the applications. Now these, uh, this uh, gallery has uh, six GI applications. And I had mentioned each one uh, has a different workflow associated with it. So there's one application for conducting landscape analysis. There's another to understand intact habitat around uh, an area that you select, whether that's a county or a watershed. There's a way to investigate the weighting of those different cores, uh, looking at land cover change, uh, selecting and prioritizing those land, those land cover uh, cores. And, uh, and really these apps, while they're distinct workflows, they do harmonize together. So you can kind of go from one to the next. We don't have enough time to go into all of those. So I'm actually going to just spend uh, a few moments uh, exploring the landscape analysis and the core weighting. This application is the landscape analysis app. And the first thing I wanna point out is that there are a series of layers on the left. The geoprocessing uh, firepower underneath the hood uh, is weighted raster overlay. And if you're familiar with that or, or maybe not, uh, what it essentially does is each of these layers is a raster layer and it stacks them on top of one another and then um, adds up uh, the, the values of cells um, in that stack to be able to tell you which cell is most or least suitable depending on the layers that you selected. So right now this map comes as a default with a 50% weight on biodiversity index and a 50% weight on ecological redundancy. If I was to say I wasn't interested in ecological redundancy, but I was actually more interested in endemic species, I could adjust those sliders, hit apply, and it's going to on the fly recalculate and show me where, which cells throughout the US uh, match that recipe, if you will, closest. This is the sort of workflow I remember doing in a, a desktop environment. And every time you wanted to change those sliders, the weights, or the scores associated with it, it was several hours. So I, it, selfishly, I, I really love this because it's so quick to be able to get a, a coarse understanding of a landscape and hone in on areas that you might be interested in. Now there's multiple different layers and you might notice that there's display settings. So um, perhaps we're looking for areas that might be more likely for wetlands or we want to investigate uh, closer. Um, I'm going to add elevation in. Click on detailed settings. These are the classes within the layer and you can actually adjust the scoring of those classes to give preference to one area or the other. So in this case, we're saying that we're interested in elevation at about 20%, um, but within elevation, we actually really are more interested in lower elevations rather than higher. If we add in some slope, we can open up that uh, detailed settings and say, we're interested in areas that are flatter. Similarly, we can add in land cover, and I might say that I am particularly interested in uh, areas with emergent wetlands and woody wetlands. I'm the most interested in that, I might be middle interested in pasture and hay. Maybe that's some of the some of the um, areas that, that had been drained previously. I'm middle interested in open water. I might not be so interested in sh uh, shrub. And I'm going to zero out the deciduous forest, evergreen forest, and mixed forest. Now I quick up, click apply, and now with that new uh, recipe for the weighted raster overlay, it's now going to quickly recalculate and show me where in the state matches this new this new scenario. So this is really a course uh, 
a landscape analysis tool. It's looking at raster cells. These are a 30 by 30 meter grid. Um, so it's pretty, pretty good. Uh, you still would always need boots on the ground, uh, but it does uh, allow a quick cursory uh, uh, tool to kind of zoom in on areas you're interested in. Now, I've been talking about these cores a lot. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, show you what they look like really quickly. This is a web map with, with the cores. And you recall that they're at least 100 acres and at least 200 meters wide. And each of these cores, these are simply polygons that have then been enriched with a whole host of environmental data from characteristics of stream and flow, uh, uh, wetland characteristics, species characteristics, uh, forest and different vegetation percentages, uh, as well as several different habitat and biodiversity indexes. It's all been enriched into the core, so each core has that in its attribute table. It's then been summed up and uh, given a score, and you'll see here on the left here, uh, good is 1.6 to 3.3, and then it goes all the way to best. So that's where you kind of get a, a general understanding of at the, at the top level, which of these cores are the most ecologically robust and important, and which one maybe um, are, are not quite as good, but still have some, some value. Now, that last mile of analysis for, say, a mitigation project, you could be looking at either of these. You might look for what, where are the really good cores, and then where are the, are the areas next, next door, so to speak, that might be a, a mitigation opportunity. Or you could be looking for the ones that are maybe not so great. Maybe they have, uh, maybe they've been drained or something like that. But all the other characteristics match, and so it would be actually a really good candidate for uh, for ecological uplift. So this next application here looks similar to the first one, but rather than a raster surface, it's actually all of those cores, all of those enriched cores. And you'll notice that there are default settings. So this first uh, default is a green infrastructure center default. And so this has a weighting scenario that is really focused on green infrastructure from kind of a planning and a development perspective. Whereas if I was to select to the biodiversity defaults, it's going to shift slightly showing those cores which are most, uh, most important from just a purely biodiversity standpoint. So again, these sliders can be adjusted um, based on what, uh, what you're most interested in uh, for, for a given project or for resources you might be trying to, to find. In this case, I'm gonna ramp up wetland percentage quite a bit, and I'm going to maybe give it a little bit more to flow uh, and click apply, and it's going to cook through those numbers. There's actually a, a server on the back end that uh, reclassifies all these things and gives me that new, uh, that new uh, results. Um, one thing that I also find uh, interesting in, in how these, these tools work is that it could be a course analysis. You're looking for potential projects, but you can also use it for, you know, if you think of an environmental gradient, where are certain types of vegetation found? Where are certain types of species found? If you know that environmental gradient, What's the elevation? What's the aspect that they prefer? You can actually punch that in and get a, a quick sense of where you might find those environmental assets. So I could keep talking about this for a while because it, it's some of my favorite applications, but I'm actually going to jump back to the PowerPoint instead and um, be uh, the first to announce that those green infrastructure cores are actually in the process of being updated. So I had mentioned that they become enriched. We take the different environmental data and it gets enriched into those polygons. Well, that needs to be done every so often so that it's up to date and current with, uh, with the authoritative data sets. So we're expecting uh, that newest update to be done soon. And, uh, and then it'll just be a seamless experience. Um, once they're updated, it'll be announced uh, more broadly. Uh, and, and then you'll have instant access to, uh, to all of that. Um, I have a ton of resources here 
Um, and if anyone has any questions, feel free to drop me an email um, or we can talk about it uh, later at the end of this webinar, but my email is danielmartin at esri.com. These resources I'll drop in the chat, but then we'll also be uh, including them with the follow-up uh, email from the webinar. But essentially just all in one place, we have the web page. These are the most commonly hit green infrastructure data layers, although there are more up there. These are the ones that we, uh, that we find uh, asked for the most, as well as those green infrastructure apps. So with that, I'm gonna wrap things up. Thank you all for uh, uh, taking the time to walk through this with me and uh, back to you, Jeremy. Great, thank you, Daniel. And I'm gonna go ahead and jump back in. So, and just as a EOP, we're about halfway through our webinar. Again, if you have any questions that are technical based or for the speakers in particular, please scroll down to the bottom of the screen and you can use that Q&A uh, box down at the bottom to for those otherwise general comments to the chat box. So I'm gonna go ahead and open up a little bit about what we are providing in Ecobot. Uh, as a series of tools to help with mitigation, banking, planning, both from the perspective of getting, uh, perhaps deciding on where new sites might be, uh, make sense, might be uh, productive to put in, as well as potentially for the, the sales of some of those credits. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and actually ask a question to Robert and Tara just to kind of get us moving here a little bit. Um, Tara, when when you all at, at Kilmainhorn are uh, trying to determine where you're going to select a new site, what's the process, not the whole overarching process, but how do you decide on where you're going to place your new bank? Um. The main factors in finding a spot for a mitigation bank well, the main driver is impact to resources. And I was glad that, you know, um, Daniel circled or came around to the reverse of that green infrastructure tool as a helpful tool in citing mitigation banks. Um, when I worked in North Carolina, I was looking for sites almost all the time. Um, I kept saying, if anybody finds me turned over in my car before you help me look and see the degraded stream and the cow right there, because that's the best mitigation site. Um, and I can tell you when I started, it was sitting on the floor with a gazetteer and the soil survey, um, kind of comparing those two things. The gazetteer did a good job of showing what was forested and what was not on the printed page. Um, but on top of that, what you also do need is um, economic data for growth, you know, for the impacts. And then you need um, also to be in a place where there's enough surface water um, that economic development is going to hit the resources. Citing a mitigation bank um, in a place of high economic growth with no aquatic resources doesn't sell a lot of credits. And so um, it is looking at those things, which is why I'm, you know, some of the stuff you're probably going to talk about with Ecobot is really exciting from a mitigation planning and citing standpoint. Um, more recently at Kimley Horn, I've done less of looking for sites because I've work primarily with a client in South Carolina who has a lot of land already. So it's sorting through their land and finding those same things. Okay. Yeah, so really what I'm trying to do here is build a bridge between what yeah. uh, Esri and uh, gr these green infrastructure apps are providing the, this macro view. How can those macro views help us with some of that decision-making? And then also now to look on a project, individual project basis, how we can utilize those tools as well. So Robert, how about you? You got want to chime in a little bit about your guys' process with that? Yeah, I'll go ahead and second what Tara said. Um, proximity to impacts is probably the number one driver. After that, it's finding aquatic resources that are degraded uh, and willing property. Uh, and typically finding a uh, degraded resource that has one, two, or maybe at most three property owners um, that are willing and want you to do the project. 
Great, thank you. So I, yeah, again, I wanted to really like stitch the, the, the gap here. And so because the tools that we're gonna look at here in respect to Ecobot are much more focused on these individual project bases. So what I, what I did was I, pull, I, I pulled a few screenshots just to keep it simple. I didn't wanna have a bunch of moving parts here. So for those of you who are already using Ecobot, some of you might be looking at a familiar screen here. For those of you who are not, it'll be just a good walkthrough in terms of some of the simple processes that uh, allow for some of those planning. So these are these are some of my projects that I'm working on. Um, you know, what when I'm when I'm looking at this particular screen, um, and I'm wanting to determine a few things. In this particular situation, we're talking about. 404, 401, somebody has done a series of wetland delineations and stream classifications. Now they're ready to go in and take a look as they're moving towards permitting um, to be able to figure out where some of those mitigation banks might be uh, available uh, in context or in the vicinity of their given project. So here we are looking at a handful of projects. And then if I click on one of those projects, that I'm able, then I immediately get a, uh, a viewer showing me where any of those sample points were collected. And as you can see in that window in the center of the screen, you know you can zoom in and out to, to various levels of uh, detail um, and, and from landscape level or state level or regional level, all the way down to an individual individual sample point basis. And then a lot of those layers are available to turn on and off uh, on the far right. So now we know, okay, this is the particular project we're looking at, Big Cypress Sandbank. Um, uh, it's the Atlantic Gulf Coastal Plain. And if this project is moving forward, there's going to be some potential impacts or we're looking at augmenting or expanding into a mitigation bank area. What is some of that, <clears throat> data that's available to us and how can we set that into motion so opening up the the particular project i'm able to see a whole list of those sample points get into those if i want some specific details but i think what's of more interest from the planning level and from mitigation level as well as the acquisition uh, the process of applying for your uh, uh your clients permits are more of the information down in the far right. So connecting to ArcGIS online, being able to pull your shape files in and out from Ecobot, but then also being able to pull those specific downloads um, from the uh, specific project into your project for or for planning purposes. But just scrolling down on that screen, we actually have uh, now in the uh, uh, dashboard here a series of tools that will help with uh, furthering the process of mitigation banking, either A, again, finding credits that you need, or B, uh, potentially helping hone in on areas that need, uh, might need some credits. And we'll get into that further here in a little moment, in a moment. The other thing that's really important here too that we have available is the uh, download project species list. So you can actually pull down a, a species list that's just the basis in a C CSV file that can be utilized to help with any planning purposes in terms of creating that plant palette um, for your mitigation bank. Um, and then potentially being able to lump that together from a series of projects. Say I'm working on a series of wetlands around the Asheville, North Carolina area where we do not have a lot, we do have them here. And so I might pull a species list down from all of the wetlands that I have worked on within the context of this area, maybe a 30, mile radius, 60 mile radius. And then I can have an aggregate lump of what are the dominant species um, to be able to utilize that for planning purposes. So, um, so, but let's go ahead and jump into some of the mitigation banking tools. So one of the things that we've done in context to Ecobot here is we have bridged the gap with Ribbits and the database that Ribbits is pulling from. Um, Again, just putting it all in one place so that we can know what mitigation banks are available in context to the project that we're working on and either looking for credits or are there not enough credits 
in this particular area that we may uh, would make sense to start doing some hunting and sleuthing for, maybe using the green infrastructure tools that Daniel talked about, or perhaps some of that deeper partnership that we have with Esri. Um, uh, some of you have heard my presentations with Gina and Neil in the past with the wetland indicator uh, model, which helps us get a better understanding of where wetlands could be more potentially or easily restored to. So some great tools for working towards that uh, mitigation planning side of things. But let's take a look back in from the project level. So in that in that map viewer, we can see now we're I'm zoomed out to more of a regional perspective here on the same project. You can see some of those sample points in the center of the screen is the, the blue location icon. Um, of course, they're very close together. So now they're they're compact and on top of each other. So we get a perspective of where the projects are. So in the next screenshot, um, I've pulled out a little bit further and I've turned off some of those additional layers or shape files so that I can just get a view of one, where my project is in respect to the region. And then two, I've turned on the mitigation banks uh, layer so that I can see where those are. And then of course we could turn on the, the Huck 8 layer again to make, you know, if we need to make sure that we're in the, the same hydrologic unit and be able to correspond accordingly. Now the next piece that is really great, again, piggyback in from, from Ribbits is that we also have, um, you can actually go ahead and click on one of those uh, uh, mitigation banks, figure out which one it is and then go back into your list um, in, inside of Ecobot here and pull open that particular mitigation bank, see where it is, whether it's pending, whether it's uh, already selling credits, whether it's sold all its credits and is closed out, all the contact information that is necessary to help set those into motion and potentially um, make a close. So beneficial here, both for consultants looking for mitigation credits, as well as consultants that are looking to sell credits, and then also for the mitigation bankers, um, being able to have a, a, a house that people can easily find the, uh, the data or the uh, mitigation banks that they'd be looking for in context to their project. And one of the things that I know that uh, Ecobot is doing is, is that we're pulling on the, uh, the, the data bank for this on a daily basis so that it's, uh, it's updated uh, every day or regularly enough that you uh, get the updates on what those credits are. And so that's a really helpful um, addition to this tool set as well. Um, what I wanted to uh, kind of bring our eyes back to is, is the collection of data. Again, these, this video that we're watching here is showing data points that are being collected, blue being wetland points, green being upland points. As points are being collected, it gives us a better idea of where, again, both Tara and Robert spoke into, where are the impact areas, where are the areas that make sense to, um, to uh, focus on, and being able to, therefore, from a banking perspective, make a better predictive or a more uh, strategic placement of where some of those wetland banks um, might make sense to set up for in the future. So um, this again is only running through March of this year. So I imagine uh, once that this once this video is updated this fall, that we'll be even able to see more of that data. But with that said, I want to turn it over to a, to Robert just on a project specific basis to talk about some of the tech that Water and Land Solutions is using in order to um, uh, potentially set their clients up for better mitigation planning and sales. So Robert, if you want to go ahead and talk and then I will queue up the video here for us. All right, thank you, Jeremy. Today I'm going to present uh, about a project in Colorado. Some of the data we collected and some of the images, videos we produced uh, to help convince the property owner that this was a good project. Uh, essentially, this project was mine, um, cattle land, 
property owner is willing to restore the landscape. Um, however, they want to show that it works with their current uses. Now you're running cattle. Uh, it also acts as a hunting ranch. Um, and they want to be able to fish it. As you can see, it's a highly degraded site. Most of our sites are one to four miles. So a lot of data is required to support these projects. We commonly are using drones for videos such as this, collect LIDAR data, um, and it gets a surface in which to do designs. Um, GPS for detailed surveys of the stream, uh, bathymetry. Um, and we've got multiple projects over many states. And so organizing this data has been pretty critical for us. Um, you'll see that there's existing aquatic resources which will have to be mapped. Uh, proposed uh, restoration actions will have to be shown. Um, so here in a minute, we'll transition to an InfraWorks video that shows future anticipated sites, um, kind of as a cartoon. However, it has some real world data uh, blended into that cartoon. Um, this is clearly a pretty degraded site if you're used to looking at Western streams. Uh, if you're used to looking at stuff on the East Coast, you might think this is pretty nice. Um, that's kind of relative to the landscape, um, the amount of disturbance that the landscape has seen. Um, and again, this was a coal mine site. It's kind of interesting because all my career I've been working on mines, whether it was in California, Ohio, West Virginia. Um, Keep coming back to the mines. Um, Jeremy, could we flip this forward 30 seconds? Yeah, it's a pretty cool site. And I could look How at this. How far forward do you want me to go, Robert? Oh, we're good. Okay. Um, pretty cool site. You can see some mine tailings in the background. Old railroad bed. Um, it was used to haul the coal out. Well. Um, the building you saw earlier was the mine store. And so this is actually the mine supported a whole town that lived within this valley. Um, these drones allow us to, uh, to show the project re relatively quickly. This is an infra works that I was describing. It shows a restored stream, wetlands along the side, uh, trees, exclusion fencing, uh, to keep cattle out, as well as wildlife while the vegetation establishes. Um, again, the landowner wants to be able to hunt the property, fish the property, and this helps illustrate how the future conditions will will look and facilitate uh, future land use. Um, this is once a trout stream. And one of the things that you noticed was very low waters during the uh, summer period. Um, by raising the groundwater table, uh, we anticipate to have water resources that will support trout. And then since it's a hunting property, here's some elk walking across a uh, wildlife crossing. Um, again, this is to encourage the property owner uh, to move forward with the project. Uh, we also do on these projects a lot of 2D modeling. And this is to support risk analysis. This is a 2D model produced in SRH2D, it's overlaid on Google Earth. And this is a fly through that shows uh, a typical flood event and how wet the valley will be in the springtime. Um, 
and we can fly through this and then this allows the proper data owner to know what it's going to look like. Um, another project, different geological context, um, the cattle farm in Pennsylvania that's going under construction here this year. Um, graded water resources, uh, it's been undermined. Um, and again, some of the data that we collect here is going to be LIDAR, macro invertebrates, um, document all the existing aquatic resources. Um, here we need to convince the property owners that they're still going to be able to use their property if they're farming. Uh, so that's going to include cattle exclusion fences, uh, improved stream crossing. Um, that'll reduce or increase their access during flooding. Um, a lot of data goes into this project. Um, I get really excited about watching videos myself and a lot of the property owners do as well. And while we're out there flying drones, it's amazing how many of the property owners want us to get good aerial photos of their farms and houses and we'll even put them on their wall. Um, so here you can see we have cattle in the streams. That's probably the main source of degradation to this project. Um, Cattle exclusion fencing will, will help prevent uh, future degradation of the project once it's completed. Um, we're also going to protect uh, infrastructure such as the roadway adjacent to the project. Um, what else can I say about this one? Yeah. I think this is good, Robert. I think it gives good people a good idea of the utilization of the drones and also some of the software that is utilized to help depict some of the designs to try to help people to uh, uh, the, see what their project might look like. So maybe while we're here, before we pivot, I'm gonna go ahead and ask you the question, like how do you first begin that contact with the, uh, the landowners? Like how did, you know, What's your all process in determining where and when and how to bridge that that gap? So a lot of our property owners are friends of friends. Uh, so it's a network of people that we know um, that put us in contact with people that own land. Uh, sometimes it's used through GIS to find suitable property and then approach individual property owners without a previous contact. Um, in which case we're using all the spatial data such as existing aquatic resources, distance to impacts, um, and using that to inform our decision of which property owners will, uh, will approach. But our preferred approach is to go through our contact list. That's great. And so, Tara, I'm going to go ahead and piggyback. Like, how how uh, how are how are you doing it on on your side? I'm sorry, I missed the, the first part how, of it. The finding how <laughs> how are you making those initial contacts with potential landowners and ah yeah, uh, yeah. um throughout my career um it has never been necessarily contacts or um it's cold calls a lot of times. It's um, finding the best sites and then talking people into doing it. And um, it may, you know, there's, it's a bigger industry now, but generally um, from experience, the best site isn't, doesn't just fall towards you. Um, and then especially, you know, there's some folks on this participating in this webinar that are from been doing it for a long time too and just looking for the degraded places and then talking people into the projects and scale um, and that's changed and again for the past six years I've been working very closely with Warehouser and helping determine which of their 
significant properties in South Carolina is best for mitigation. And it's not, you know, there's no direct correlation with what's best for timber production where it is. So it's, um, the site is extremely important. So that generally comes first in consideration. And then there's um, also the, the dance of the approach to the landowners and, you know, do they want, do they want Big Brother watching them? Do they want to put conservation easements on their properties and like really being able to um, tell the story and um, yeah, not have it be so personalized. No, in the renderings, those I, I I could watch your videos all day too, Robert. That's a really pretty significant tool because it's um, a long time to to stay in front of. I remember trying to talk someone, you know, work with several landowners over several miles of stream corridor, and this was, I don't know, 15 years ago, and I still feel bad because they said, well, what's the downside? And I said, you're gonna have me showing up at your house in perpetuity. And then I, I switched jobs and I don't, I never showed up again. And I still feel bad about that. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's, it's definitely a, a landowner relationship for a long time, perpetuity in general. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So let me, I'm going to close out our slides here and then see if we can answer a couple questions that have been fielded. So just up, I put October 7th, December 7th is our next uh, webinar. And we're going to hear from uh, uh, EPA and from U.S. Fish and Wildlife updates on National Wetland Condition Assessment, as well as NWI updates. Um, also, some pretty exciting news there. Some of the NW others been funding approved this year to improve those data sets. And there has also, um, they, we've been taken further down the path experimenting with utilizing uh, uh, conglomerate uh, data in Ecobot to help better update uh, some of those shape files that are available through NWI. So that should be fun. Please do tune in for that in early December. Um, and then what I would like to do now is just go ahead and close this portion out. And there were a couple of questions that came in on the Q&A. So let's see, somebody, somebody asked, uh, Travis Hamrick asked, will data generated within Ecobot be made available to third parties, assuming user privacy is protected um, in terms of delineations and acres and uh, HUC 8 level information. So yes, we're working out the details of what that might look like. Um, and certainly vital, vital to divorce the, uh, the data from specific projects, but to be able to look at it from a more regional perspective looking at hotspots, as Daniel spoke into with the green infrastructure tool, looking to see how, okay, in this particular area, maybe a three mile grid, we've got 20 wetland delineations that have been conducted in the last six months. We know we've got a hotspot. So some of that data is uh, potentially very useful for helping better hone in the uh, de determining where a new site might be. Um, so really looking forward to how that might promulgate the industry. The other thing, of course, that that helps with is the direct sales of credits. As Tara and Robert both spoke into the impact areas that you're working in, the more impact, unfortunately, also means the more likely you're going to be able to uh, get your credits in your mitigation bank sold. So uh, Robert, there's a question directed specifically to you in here. I'm gonna go ahead and call it out. Could you repeat the software names? that you all use for modeling the wetland restoration. You spoke to the 2D modeling and also to the 3D flyover renderings. Yeah, so typically for hydraulic modeling, I'm using SRH2D. Sometimes we use Hecrest, 2D version of it. Um, I've used FastMac in the past, um, but I prefer SRH2D and that's the most common one uh, used in the West. In the East, S um, Hecrest is most commonly used. So Robert, um, would you mind dropping those in the uh, the chat box just so people can get a, a visual on that? All right, so uh, Daniel, uh, there's a question directed to you from Leyland Searles. I'm not sure if it's Searles. Um, sorry, Leyland, if I beat up your last name, people do that to my name all the time. Um, there's a question about the uh, live landscape analysis. You notice a lot of pale green at points. Does this reflect missing data? Is there a color default? Uh, 
if you could just open that up a little bit. Yeah, that's a great question. So um, you might recall that I was sliding sliders around, right? And if I was to take one slider and put it at zero, then what that does is completely knocks out that cell or that core from even consideration. So that's why uh, there would be blank spots. Okay. So we are right at the, uh, the end of our webinar here. Um, yeah, so it's 1.30 Eastern time. If anybody needs to jump out, um, thank you for joining us today. Looks like we've got a couple more things that I just want to wrap up here before we close out. So, okay, Robert, thanks for posting, uh, posting that information in the chat channel. Uh, Cameron or Olivia, if you would grab that information so that we could sandwich that with, with Daniel's links that he also provided so we can get that out to everyone um, and, uh, and kind of make it go from there. So um, it looks like we are getting things taken care of there. Great, thank you. So uh, Tara, any, any parting remarks that you'd like to leave us all with? I just I think that um, from infrastructure and development through um, compensatory mitigation and green infrastructure technology is going to definitely change how we do it. Um, if folks are worried about the human element coming out of it, I don't I don't think that will happen as long as you know we all stay attached to Jeremy, like you said, getting fueled up, being out in the remote part. That's what drives me too, and scale that technology brings is, is, is a win-win. We're not losing anything, I don't think, in this realm. Great, thank you, Tara. Robert, mm -hmm. closing remarks from you. I think the technology allows us to do more projects and retain information better. Uh, we put our eyes on everything, uh, but then the photos, geo-reference locations for all the data, all the things you saw in the field, it helps you remember what you saw when you were out in the field. Great. Thank you, Robert. Daniel, closing remarks from you. Um, all I'll say is that uh, I feel like this is a really exciting moment in time where there is a all of these tools and strategies and, um, and then the technical world kind of adds, uh, adds, adds gas to the fire. So really exciting. And I love seeing all the other types of work that, uh, that folks are doing. Thank you uh, for putting all this together. Yeah, Great. thanks, Jeremy. You bet. And thank you all once again for participating. And thank you all in the audience for coming out and joining us. Hopefully you learned something today, even if it's just a few pieces of information on some tech or tools that might be interesting to you. Uh, but also just in promulgating this conversation going forward of how wetland science and technology are intertwined and an important part of our future planning um, so that we can guarantee that we have a healthy series of ecosystems for generations to come. So Tara, Robert, Daniel, thank you very much. And I'll look forward to seeing everyone in early December. See you. Thank you, Jeremy. Bye-bye. Thanks all.